Great. Okay, we're live. All right, the bells are ringing near me, so it must be 12 noon. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for dropping into our, bla what do we call it, a brown bag webinar, lunch, conversation, chat. Uh, my name is Woody Labowney. I'm the interim president and CEO at San Francisco Heritage. And I'm joined here by another San Francisco Heritage luminary, Carrie Young. I'm Carrie Young. Hi, I'm San Francisco Heritage's communications and programs manager and happy to work with Woody on Heritage in the Neighborhoods Visitation Valley. And we are joined today by some awesome folks from the Visitation Valley History Project, and I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, Cynthia, did you want to start? Sure. You're not going to see my face because I don't like to be on camera, but uh, you'll hear my voice and you'll hear my fascinating story about one of our movie legends. Thanks, Cynthia. Edie? Uh, Edie Epps, uh, one of the authors of uh, Arcadia's visitation, San Francisco's Visitation Valley book uh, back about 10 or 11 years ago mm -hmm. and just part of the Visitation Valley History Project. Great. And we have Russell here. Hey, this is Russell Marine, a resident. Um, I don't love to be on camera, but I'll use this as my opportunity for, to audition for the next uh, James Bond movie. So <laughs> you'd be <laughs> but, a good uh, James Bond. Uh, <laughs> you'd be good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, well, send that to the next uh, director, so <laughs> okay. we'll have some uh, good comments about history in the neighborhood today. Wonderful. I, you know, I think, so let's see, we have a, a video interview, a short interview with Edie on, on our website, sfheritage.org, as part of our Visitation Valley History Month, and did, we posted our, our, our conversation mm -hmm. with Russell, too, right? Yes, we did. There, that's up there, too, so you can learn more about these great folks also on our website, which you know, how much Visitation Valley stuff can you get? Um, it's so great. You know, Heritage in the Neighborhoods is all about taking an entire month of our time to focus on a neighborhood that we love in San Francisco. And we particularly love Visitation Valley. Um, uh, for me, I just love talking about neighborhoods that even longtime San Franciscans just aren't as familiar with as they should be. And Visitation Valley totally fills the bill. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna show just a little slideshow here, uh, overview of what we've done this month and some of the highlights and things that have jumped out to me that um, I thought were just particularly great this month uh, working with people in Visitation Valley. And all you folks here um, on the panel, you might call us, uh, feel free to chime in at any point and uh, share your own thoughts. So let's see if I can get our presentation going here. One sec. All right, can you all see that? Yes. So as I said, Heritage and Neighborhoods is a program we started about a year ago, maybe a little more, um, where we go to different neighborhoods for an entire month. And we try to just like put all our focus on um, the neighborhood every day, uh, at least every weekday. So some of the things we talked about about Visitation Valley this month um, are things like from the very beginning, the stories and the lore, such as the famous rock, mm -hmm. which, um, goes back to the uh, story of the Spanish uh, colonial party coming up in the 1770s and having a Catholic mass on that rock. Uh, that story seems to have kind of come up in the early 20th century, but the rock, no matter if you believe the story or not, is definitely still there. So uh, this is actually in a backyard. What block is this? We don't have to reveal the actual location, but what block is the rock on? Delta Street. Delta Street. Yes, and in the picture, that's uh, Betty Parsha, one of the other members of the Visitation Valley History Project. And, and I'd like to point out on the map, on the map, visitation is misspelled. <laughs> so. Yes, a common, common thing throughout the years is that they mm -hmm. put that T in there instead of the C in the middle. It's one of the few neighborhoods in San Francisco that still has that Spanish spelling. Um, and then this, I think, is probably... I don't know, the most galvanizing thing for me is this little uh, corner of three buildings on Leland and Rutland uh, that I think just go back to the very beginnings of Visitation Valley as a neighborhood. And that right now there are plans to uh, demolish these buildings and put a new, uh, a new building there. And I just think between the mural and 
these these really sort of like storefronts that you would see in a small town um, almost anywhere in America at the time in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, these are just treasures. And so we wrote a little post about our favorite buildings on Leland Avenue, and these were definitely in there. And then Carrie, what's this, what's the big secret about Visitation Valley that's not a secret anymore? <laughs> The, the big secret that's not a secret anymore is the <laughs> Visitation Valley Greenway. Well, and, you know, the neighborhood has a lot of great open spaces. It's right next to McLaren Park and, and of course, the Greenway, which is really the pride of the neighborhood, uh, spanning six blocks, um, awesome native plants and public art and community gardens and what have you. And, you know, the the Greenway is really, you know, what is bringing some new folks to Visitation Valley and they're coming by way of the Crosstown Trail, for example, which, you know, traces across the city and to all its different, San Francisco's different open spaces and the Visitation Valley Greenway is a highlight on that Crosstown Trail. So again, it's bringing new folks to the neighborhood, which is great. And it's, yeah, I don't know if the History Project folks want to say something about it. I know they love it, and I love it. <laughs> I saw a question in the chat about uh, uh, how was it created, uh, or what was there before, and how was it created. Uh, Cynthia and I uh, were on a walk about two weeks ago. We did a history sort of walk through the Greenway. Um, so how was it created was really just neighborhood advocacy over many, many years. Um, but I think the more interesting question is why are they there? Why were, are these six uh, lots over several blocks um, never built upon? And Cynthia, maybe you can chime in on that. Um, they were they were water lots. There were water lines un underneath them, and they were just fenced off and and uh, filled with weeds, and you know of no use to anybody, I guess, except for the water department. Uh, some, some of the memories of longtime residents were, you know, they were fenced off lots. They were little low fences and the children could still go in there and play. And, uh, in the weeds. So, yeah, <laughs> so it was like recreation, actually, for some of the children that lived nearby. And we've heard uh, that some were used for victory gardens during uh, WW2. Um, and also just, you know, I think at least I learned over the last two weeks that it's, they're not owned by the Reckon Park. Reckon Park manages them, but they're still owned by the water department. Mm -hmm. And apparently the water lines are not are no longer underneath it, which we didn't know until we did this walk, mm -hmm. but but they are still owned by the water department. Yeah, and one of the, the original persons uh, who advocated for it, Ann Seaman, and that, that was one of her points that, you know, now that those water lines are no longer there, they were in danger of being sold for development. So the neighborhood advocacy did actually save it from being built out for, uh, they would have been sold off for as surplus property from uh, the water department. They're definitely the sort of tourist attraction. If you get tourists to Visitation Valley, I feel like the Greenway has done it. And also just shows up the incredible weather that I think um, people maybe aren't aware of that Visitation Valley has. It's just wonderful to walk through the Greenway and you get so much sunshine. Well, and then I think, you know, Carrie and I, we often talk about this at Heritage, that what people love more than anything else is a mystery. So mm -hmm. we talked about uh, Visitation Valley's, well, we won't, I don't know if we call it the mystery house, like one of those <laughs> Oregon, you know, vertigo things, but it definitely was um, a mystery for the Visitation Valley History Project. And are we any closer? Well, Carrie, maybe tell us what the mystery was, and maybe the Visitation Valley folks can tell us if there's any solution to the mystery. Sure, this is a house at 2 Han Street in Visitation Valley. And it's a house that the History Project folks have been researching for a long time. And, you know, they they found out that it was previously owned by, you know, a few sisters. We're still figuring out if that's the case. And, you know, it's it's such a of a different design, you know, an earlier design that is um, an anomaly of the uh, you know the other houses in that area where it is and so you know they figured it must have been moved from somewhere else but where was it moved from and it's also kind of oddly set on the lot and 
maybe was cut in half. So there are all these different questions <laughs> about the house, how it got there, who moved it, why they moved it. And so we wrote a history mystery post about it and we actually got a little closer thanks to a David Gallagher who was here to watch yeah. it. <laughs> So I, what I loved was the house was owned by, this is the story. And I love the stories, even if they're not true, which was the <laughs> house was owned by sisters. And then there was some settlement of the estate and they split the house up, right? One sister took part of the house, another moved another part of the house. Well, the somewhere. part of the story too was that they loved their childhood home so much, right? That they didn't want to part with it. And so they split it up in different pieces so they could yeah. each have a piece of their home. That was part of the story. Right. Yeah. But what do we think actually is going on now, uh, Visitation Valley folks? Do we have any, are we any closer? Well, uh, we do have the location of the original house, thanks to David Gallagher again. And, um, but we don't know really where that second half of the building or the top half, oh, we're not sure. Is it the top or the bottom? <laughs> I think but it would have been you, the top. It's more huh. like the Winchester Mystery House because when you do enter through the front door there, uh, you go up about maybe five stairs, you open the door and there's the a finished floor, like a ballroom floor and uh, you know uh, what would be the attic, but it really is another floor should be there. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we'll have to keep looking for that other story of the yeah, house. And I think, yeah, the photo that David Gallagher found, I mean, that was just sort of the, the confluence of perfect, uh, like you said, a perfect storm of research. And uh, it was on 23rd Street, um, right right where the 101 was built. So clearly it had to move or be demolished. So um, that kind of confirms that it was moved. We knew it was sort of moved just by the way it was designed, but the location of the house, that uh, David found right where the freeway is now. And it would have been an easy shot from that location down here because they were building out the freeway. So moving it that far was plausible at the time. And I think we, 50s, late 50s, early 50s, that it was moved. Um, the, the sister's story, you know, we did some research into the family and it's possible, I mean, there was a, a part of the story was that the sisters owned a dress shop or there was a three sisters dress shop. We couldn't confirm that, but the family we think was in the fashion business, one of the family members. Um, and it could have been just over the years that the, someone in the family who was in the fashion business got turned around and said, well, sisters owned a fashion store or a dress store. So we're still trying to put all the pieces yeah. together. Yeah. I guess we should make a pitch here since David found it. You know, uh, Open SF History is this large collection of historical San Francisco photos, and you can go to opensfhistory.org. Mm -hmm. And there's photos that uh, the Western Neighborhoods Project has scanned for that site that are unidentified, that people just didn't know, you know, where is this? We know it's San Francisco. And so it was a long time unidentified photo that David was trying to figure out. <laughs> You know, he could recognize a building or recognize that it was San Francisco and there had a dis dis distinctive building in the photo. And then the history mystery comes up while he's looking for that same yeah. uh, identification and they totally went together. He said, that building's the same as this building. <laughs> um, it was just a great uh, coincidence, almost kind of an amazing coincidence, but it was a great reason to have Visitation Valley Month to have little mysteries maybe get closer to being solved. And I, I personally, I mean, I, I don't know if my uh, history colleagues agree with this, but I don't think the other part is still there. It, it's still it's out gone. there. I think the top, just to me, like when you cut that building off, I don't know how they would have saved the top. Okay. I mean, that's just looking at it, like how did they do that? Even today, that would have been difficult, but that, that's just my theory on it. But I, it was cut, but I don't believe the top part is still there. But I hope maybe we'll find it, but yeah. Well, we think it's only happened in the 50s. So if you're watching this and you have some memory or no, please reach out and we'd like to learn more about the story. So, um, and then I think a thing that made uh, Visitation Valley History Month different and more special in some ways than the other history months we've done is we got to do some very personal interviews with residents of uh, Visitation Valley and, uh, and mm -hmm. do little videos that, you know, like Edie, you did. So Carrie, who is this? This is a uh, resident, Selena Lowe. 
She's currently a social worker that lives in Visitation Valley. She's lived there her whole life. And she told us some great memories of a store, a grocery store that her parents ran for over 20 years uh, in the uh, bottom floor of their home on Visitation Avenue. And she shared some great photos with us too. This is her in the store, like circa 1987 on Halloween, she dressed as a Giants player. And of course, Candlestick Park is, you know, right next to Visitation Valley. And um, so this, yeah, these were some great interviews where um, residents like Edie, again, just shared some of their favorite places, some secrets, and these are, you know, short and sweet, and you can go to our, you know, website to, to view them and our YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I think they were a great addition, and I, I really want to thank the Visitation Valley History folks for uh, allowing us to interview you and put you on camera and uh, yeah. and with Russell we we gave you kind of a deep Q&A so thank you guys for doing that mm -hmm. um, we talked about you know this is the other thing you know when I talk to somebody from San Francisco and I say what do you know about Visitation Valley well a do they know Visitation Valley exists that's yeah. the start <laughs> but if they do know it exists like what what do they know about it and many people who didn't grow up anywhere say in the southeast part of town they might have these just very negative memories of what they've heard about Visitation Valley. And that includes Sunnydale and um, the housing projects and the Geneva Towers. And so, you know, a big part of what we try to do is in talking about a neighborhood is, you know, there's, you might not know anything about it. And then you might know just kind of the wrong things about it, right? There's so much more to a neighborhood than what you might read in the newspaper. And so we, we kind of went a little deeper into Sunnydale a bit and Geneva Towers which is a very interesting story and a lot of memories for people who remember what happened to the towers uh, eventually. And uh, Edie, what happened to the towers? Tell us a little bit. Do you know anything about Geneva Towers? <laughs> well, <laughs> a little did bit. You ask, oh, did you ask me or Cynthia? Any of you, tell us a okay. little bit about Geneva Towers. Well, I knew, I knew it was built as luxury apartments. It was supposed to be something like uh, what Lake Merced was at the time. Right, you could Park drive your said. car right up to the front door and someone would take your car, go park it for you and you just go up to your apartment. And, uh, you know, that's what it was sold to the neighborhood as in 1963. But, you know, it became something a lot more yeah. than that. Joseph Eichler, who was the builder and developer, basically went bankrupt and... <laughs> Um, the, the house, the, the towers went from this sort of like, we're going to sell it to, well, let's say like upper middle class folks working at San Francisco airport, for example, something like mm -hmm. that to, um, basically they just had, they bailed on it. And then it became, um, essentially a, a very poorly managed building, um, for people with in section eight and things like that. And it, Really, I, I, we, in one of the posts, we kind of did a, Connie Chung came out here and did a little sort of a national story on the towers and um, the difficulties they were facing managing it essentially and the difficulties that people had living there. Um, but, and this is where I talked about with Sunnydale too, there are so many lives that have passed through these buildings. I mean, families that have had wonderful memories that have like grown up there that have had connections that have just go through generations. And you can't just talk about these places based on the headlines of some crime that happens or some mismanagement by a federal agency. You've got to talk about all the people and all their, uh, the rich lives that they've lived in these places. Yeah. Uh, but but I, we, I think we, we, go ahead. We collect memories and uh, what someone uh, had posted on the last year before it was imploded, um, they had a Halloween party there. And she said she was telling how much fun it was and everybody was involved and it was just something that they never had experienced before this last Halloween party. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet the only thing was that the security guards said, well, it's, you know, past midnight or something, we have to shut it down. <laughs> but, you know, that was just a it just kind of pinpoints that life was going on there and people were having fun. Maybe not a fun you or I think about, but, you know, just basic living. Fun, yeah. You know? <laughs> sure. And then architecturally, they were very interesting. It was like a master plan development with the townhouses that are still there. 
um, and interesting to talk about the townhouses as maybe a, some sort of preservation project down the line. Um, but again, it's a big memory for people just because they were imploded uh, and, uh, and it was just people showed up on all the hillsides. Um, they, they watched the implosions. There's video you can go find on YouTube and on our yeah. channels as well. Just a, a kind of a, a little highlight of, a, of a, a long standing story in Visitation Valley that happened there. And then I guess, I don't know, is this my favorite? Yes, I guess I'll just say it. <laughs> this is my favorite thing about Visitation Valley. It's Vanessa, the Seven Mile House. I, I, I'm a big fan of roadhouses and pubs and, and Visitation Valley has had more than its share being on a major road going into San Francisco. So uh, what can anybody tell us about the Seven Mile House? Any memories, any stories, any particular attachments that the Visitation Valley folks have to it? Well, um, this one was one of, in Visitation Valley, we had three of the mile houses, the five, six, and seven mile houses. So this was the furthest one. And actually it's not in, in San Francisco, it's in San Mateo County across the line, just a little bit, but we claim it anyway. But basically the roadhouses supposedly were the distance from Portsmouth Square where the original San Francisco City Hall was out along, you know, down the peninsula. And uh, most of them were were two stories. Um, you had uh, like a bar restaurant on the bottom and you had then hotel rooms or whatever on the on the top floor this one to my knowledge was the only one story one but it was built as a one story one and uh it's still there still got great food music you know i'm just <laughs> why you know cynthia how come you could have three of this, the mile houses, but it's not three miles across that Bayshore Boulevard. No, it's not, but uh, they were there. The, the, besides the seven mile house, the six mile house, I really, it was torn down in the 1930s, but it was a beautiful Victorian building. And it was uh, run by a, a man named Pop Blanken, who not only offered the usual food, drink and lodgings, but had had in, yeah, had uh, like um, trap shooting and shuffleboard and, it, you know, games to play because we were out in the country. And, uh, and he also trained boxers, professional boxers, including gentleman Jim Corbett. So um, that one was torn down in the 30s. The Five Mile House, the original one, the facade's still there and has apartments in the back. Yeah. Um, but but this one exists closest to to what what it was built as. Yeah, a center of hospitality while you're on the road, essentially. And the the thing I think you can read more about the Mile House is on the post we have on uh, sfheritage.org. And take a look at go look at that. Just look at what the Six Mile House looked like. It was more of a resort than a, a bar. So love it. May have not when it was built. It may not have been called the Seven Mile House. I think it may have been at the toll road. So at some point it became the seven mile house, but it wasn't originally built with the name of seven mile. Yeah, I think one reason it's one story is I think it was the little toll house is what it grew out of. Um, you had to pay toll on a toll road to go through. So, um, and then I, we talked a little bit about this during the month, but maybe we can go in a little more in depth about Visitation Valley's role in some early movie making history. So um, Cynthia, can you see the screen? Can you tell us what yes. you're looking at? Okay, first of all, I moved I moved to Visitation Valley in 1998. And on my block down the block, there was a woman named Alma Taylor. And she had been born in 1911 in Visitation Valley, loved the valley, loved its history, and started sharing her stories with me. One of her stories was about when she was born in 1911, but she remembered as a girl going down to the Bayshore Hotel, which is pictured here. Um, as it is today, but she went down because a famous silent film movie star was coming to town to film in this location. So she went down with the other neighborhood folks. They went down to Hub Nutter's store, which would be on the, the ground floor here, to watch the filming. Alma originally remembered it, and she was in her 80s when she was telling me this, but she thought it was called Four Nights in a Bar Room. And there was no four nights in a bar room, but there was a 10 nights in the bar room. And I, 
I've tried to research it. Apparently there were 10 different versions of that movie made during the silent film, but none of them are specifically um, connected with, with Anna Q. Nielsen. So there were two other oral historians, um, men who were a few years younger than Alma, and they remembered it as the 1924 half a dollar bill movie being, being uh, filmed here. And that one seems more logical, but basically it's about a, a single mother who's poor and has to leave her child behind while she goes off to, to make enough money to support them both. And so she takes half, she takes a dollar bill and splits it in half, leaves half with the child. She takes half and she goes off. And the, the child is adopted by a sea captain and uh, is raised by him. And, and then eventually, of course, the mother comes back and she has the half dollar that perfectly matches the half dollar left oh, behind. You're making and, me cry, uh, Cynthia. I don't, you're, you're kind of making me choke up here a little bit. Oh, well, <laughs> it was lovely. But this this is on the left. You see what the Bayshore Hotel would have looked like probably around the, the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and then on the right, that is the lovely Anna Q, who was born in Sweden. She was pre-Garbo. Uh, at one point, she was voted the most beautiful woman in the world. She was the highest paid actress in the silent film era of Hollywood. But here she is. Apparently, I think this is when she came back and had the half dollar bill. So she reunites and they eventually marry then. So that's the that's the happy ending to the story. Wow. So um, do we know do we know what scenes were filmed? I mean, in the in the Bayshore Hotel itself? I, I apparently the the captain on the uh, I think like this is probably the interior here, but apparently the captain on the ship, his one of his first mates or somebody uh, turned out to be the father of the child. And they got into this huge fight and the father was killed. And then then Anna Q comes back and and sh she marries the captain and they live happily ever after. Whew, so okay, I, I yeah. think the interior scenes were filmed in the Bayshore Hotel in the in the bottom level in Hub Nutter's store. Right. So if you just advance the slide, because because of eBay and being able to collect things about, uh, I've got a huge collection of Anna Q. Nielsen now. I'll just admit <laughs> it. But these are some of the things like on the right. This is a, a booklet in French about half a dollar bill. Um, on the right, this is a, um, a program from a New York, a New York um, theater that was showing half a dollar bill on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that was from 1925 on the right and also on the left, so forth. It was a 1924 movie. And then if you just advance it a couple more, you, just more finds. That's the front of the program from Broadway and 110th Street. And then the next one. Whoops. Yes, that yeah. Um, th that's it. OK. Yeah. So so anyway, so I've got a lovely collection of Anna Q. Nielsen materials that I thought I was going to write a book about, but haven't done a thing about yet. So we'll, well see. Ho hopefully now you're inspired. Um, <laughs> But, but thanks to your article this month in our Visitation Valley Highlight, uh, you know, the building was shown in, I think, maybe one of your favorite buildings along Leland. And now we have an interview coming up next week with uh, the original family, the Nutter family, uh, that owned that building. And they say they have some pictures to share with us and stories. And oh, great. so that's just, I think that's one of our bigger, biggest find. <laughs> Mm, Thanks to uh, this month. Well, you know, I, I want to say also, you know, Heritage is a preservation organization. We try to like highlight and, and preserve what we think is uh, special in San Francisco. Well, it, not just what we think, but what most people think is special in San Francisco. And the, the Bayshore Hotel is, I think, a very significant building for the neighborhood. And, um, and it has a very deep history. I mean, it's been stuccoed over pretty heavily, yeah. you know, so it may not be the most beautiful looking building right now but it has a, a very singular importance to the neighborhood. And so it's mm -hmm. something that we might want to talk about in the future, recognizing in a more, um, I don't know, robust and official way, 
Okay. Um, and just the movie history itself is kind of interesting. So, but this is another building, the one I'm showing here, that I think is a highlight, standout, unique, really, in Visitation Valley. So, yeah. I don't know who can tell us more about the log cabin and the Sylvester family. Maybe Edie or Russell, you guys have some thoughts on this place. I uh, just like from the earliest knowledge that we have that. I mean, it goes back over a hundred years e easily, and um, I think. We have pictures of the buildings before the logs were attached, so it goes. Yeah, there, that picture there. What year is that? The twenties, Edie? Yeah, that's the twenties. Yeah. yeah, so that that's the buildings before it became the log cabin, or known as the log cabin. And it says, I see here. It says it's on the city and county line. I see the yeah, sign there. Yeah, it's right on the line. So I like the story that when it was more of a place of entertainment and you know people going out for dinner or drinks right. or whatever they painted the line down the middle to show you were in San Mateo County or San Francisco County and I don't know there was some I guess uh, uh, insinuation that maybe you could do different things on different sides of the line <laughs> I'm not sure um, but it's been yeah, so it was said it was said that you could stand in San Francisco and play the the um, slots in San Mateo County because because of the different different um, laws, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. Silvestri still they put a they put a line back in right. They have a line down right that you can kind of go in. So tell yes. us a little bit about Silvestri's because they're they're almost you know they're as historic as the building in a sense. Okay, the original Silvestri's came. Uh, I think it was like three brothers. They came from Tuscany and Italy in the early, very early 1900s. And they basically had a, you know, a family history of making statues, small statues. So they originally peddled them door to door and they were especially famous for their Cupid dolls that they sewed door to door. Um, but then the, the depression came along and they went back to Tuscany until the 1950s when some of the descendants of the, the first group came back to San Francisco. They set up a, an actual show showroom or an actual factory over in Glen Park. But then BART was going to build the Glen, Glen Park station on their land. So they lost it to eminent domain. And um, so they bought the property here mm -hmm. and uh, have been, that's why it says since 1956, that, that they've been in the Valley since 1956. So giant pots, urns, fountains, statuary, landscaping mm -hmm. elements, things like that is their stock and trade, right? Yes. Yeah. The do it yourself shows really brought a lot of cameras to this location. Well, it was right across the street, but to Silvestri's uh, because people had to go pick out, you know, their backyard fountains mm -hmm. and what have you, which were highlighted on these uh, television shows. Uh, but one of the things I like to say is we did have a Visitation Valley History Project had a presentation at the log cabin uh, back a few years ago, and it was really well attended by the Victorian Alliance uh, people. And uh, one of the gentlemen there, he thought, gee, did those logs come from there at the 1915 fair of uh, the Woodman of the World uh, had a, a building and it incorporated a lot of logs. And we did have one of the top Woodwind of the World um, uh, char uh, chapters here in yeah. Visitation Valley. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, one of the little mysteries I like to follow to see or try to find out more information. How did we get the logs? <laughs> because right. as Sandra, who owns the uh, building, says, they have to go in there and trim the interior because it's still grows moss it's so, <laughs> so right yeah it, it's really if you get a chance stop by and take a look at the building I yeah think i think really it's be great, fascinated it's yeah. a great highlight just because it's an unusual building it's pretty unique in san francisco it, it has its mm -hmm. own little mysteries about it but also um, with the Sylvestri business in there which definitely qualifies as a legacy business we talk about legacy businesses all the time um you know, you can pretty much walk through the whole thing and really kind of get the ambiance and the feel of the place um, with uh, the Sylvester Company in there. So another great building. And then... But speaking this. of um, significant, yeah. oh. you know, <laughs> a significant restaurant in the life, you know, of the life of the log cabin, 
was uh, George's log cabin. And, you know, Cynthia, you wrote a whole post about, you know, its long history and George's was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a notable part of that. And so can you, yeah, tell us about this really cool music flyer that you found and how you found it. Okay. So this was another, this was another eBay find a few years ago. Um, and I had one person bidding against me and I ended up having to pay a lot more than I wanted to, but I got it. Um, <laughs> so George's Fog Cabin is, this is a, from 1969 poster and it, it started as Sam's Lodge in the late twenties, thirties. And that was when we had the, the rowdiness um, with the, the line, you know, San Francisco, San Mateo line. And then it became a refined uh, Chinese American place called George's Log Cabin. And then, then in the 60s, it became a music venue. So you had different names for it. But in this 1969 one, they've gone back to George's Log Cabin. And this is, um, this was the program from, from June of 1969. Um, some of these names you'll recognize. Almond Joy at the top there, that was, was an early iteration of the Almond Brothers band. Um, so they were playing here in Visitation Valley for what, one night, I guess. And, uh, and I, I gave this to Sandra because it seemed to be a part of, of the log cabin history. And so she's had it framed and apparently it's in her living room at home, but I'm glad it found a great home and we have, we have the scan of it. So we're still here too. I can't believe the Elman brothers had to play it Tuesday. This was early iteration. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, music history there as well. Very neat. Okay, yeah, that might be the, uh, just so the, 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 uh, the finds on eBay and just how, you know, there's probably, the, since he said she's bidding against somebody, they may have been bidding because of the names on the flyer, but we're bidding because it's part of the neighborhood history. And sometimes we have to check with each other, make sure we're not bidding against each other. So we're, we're not running it up. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's kind of how we do collect some of the history is just by going on eBay, you know, finding some great things out there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, we can talk a little bit about our next steps, but I guess before Carrie and I talk about what we normally do, which is have some sort of town hall, kind of get everybody together and, and talk about everything that came up during the month and projects we might want to tackle in Visitation Valley. Uh, I'm wondering from you folks, is, is there, what did we miss? Like we couldn't do everything, right? In yeah. the 25 or whatever days we had. Yeah. So what, what are I think we, we kind of missed, we didn't touch on our industry, being that we're in the Southeast section sector of San Francisco and all the industry, American Can, Third Street, and then down to Bayshore, we had Sludge Lock Company, and then we had Southern Pacific Railroad. And we didn't really, yeah, I think we touched on it, but, you know, there's a lot more to say about, you know, their efforts during the war and what they really meant to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So that would just be one thing I would add in, uh, that industrial history, manufacturing. Any uh, businesses or, uh, I don't know, cultural things that we might have missed? Um, any particularly great buildings that we should have highlighted that, you know, um, you know, there's a lot. We can't hit it all. So yeah, it's, it's, kind of we need another month. <laughs> <laughs> a year, maybe a year. <laughs> um, I, I would like to see more about the churches of, of Visitation Valley because there's such a variety and, you know, there's the history there with, uh, with St. James and Julia Morgan, but also the Church of the Visitation, the, the stained glass windows, I think, are a real asset to the neighborhood. And if we, I would have liked to have seen that highlighted somehow, or maybe we still can, um, but but we have like we have the Korean church, we have the the um, the Vietnamese at, at Valley Baptist and so forth. We have the American Indian Church. Um, so, so I love, I love the American Indian Church. I just think that it's <laughs> it's almost like made of cinder blocks or something. Yeah. Right. It's so interesting and unique again as an architectural um style and in in the in the way it looks. So yeah, I'm with you, Cynthia. I think we could definitely get more into some of the aspects of the churches. And then 
Carrie. So I what, think what Russell, are I was, okay, was going to say, I think Russell, you, um, something may, maybe we may not have covered as much as is related to something that you wanted to share today, oh, right? Well, I <laughs> oh, yeah, think I did. one part is yeah. um, the garbage company. <laughs> and um, this is, again, I mean, if you can see this, mm -hmm. this is a report um, written in 1978. So again, this was an eBay find, and it was sort of like what Cynthia that um, this was out there and for uh, like probably forty dollars, and you know you can make an offer on it. It wasn't really up for auction, so you know we negotiated back and forth. It was the it wasn't against anyone, but just the person selling it, and it got down to about fifteen dollars, and it was like, well, this is your last chance to make an offer on it. And I kind of put a note, well, look, guy, you know. I'm the only person who would want this. <laughs> I want it because I, I, I live in the neighborhood and I used to work at the company. And so he finally sold it to me for 15 bucks. Um, but the garbage company and this report, I mean, the interesting thing about this re report is that this is when the garbage company was considering putting in an incinerator into the neighborhood to manage garbage. And, you know, nowadays and you, today, you'll probably watch TV and see one of these commercials of recology and how we rebuilt, we built the re um, recycling system from the scratch yeah in the 70s and 80s they were thinking about reburning all the garbage in the neighborhood in visitation valley <laughs> and just how the garbage company um has changed the landscape of the city and the neighborhood bayview hill you know that hold those terraces on bayview hill because of the garbage company all a lot of that land in brisbane that's um is reclaimed is san francisco garbage by the San Francisco Garbage Company mm -hmm. that's in part of uh, Visitation Valley. So that's another piece of the history of the neighborhood that uh, we didn't touch on much, but it does shape the landscape and the uh, economics of the city and the neighborhood. Sure. Russell, do you know why the, the incinerator didn't happen? Was it, was there a public, Brisbane. public outrage? Or? Yeah, yeah, public outrage, Brisbane, Little Hollywood. Hopefully Brisbane. Yeah. San Francisco, we had a few people come out to meetings, but Brisbane, they're environmentalists and they just, no way that was going to happen in there because that actually was going to be in Brisbane, but yeah. on the, you know, on the border. It would have been right on the, literally right yeah. on the border. So, yeah. so. Um, <laughs> but, you know, looking at this report, it was also, they suggested in Hunter's Point, Hunter's Point shut it down. Is it said, not mm -hmm. going to happen there. So it got pushed out here. And again, it didn't happen because of public outreach, out, outrage. And this was the 70s and the time of the environmental movement. So it, it was probably doomed to fail. Right. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's interesting. You see old photos, like aerial photos of, you know, the, the sort of hill where Little Hollywood southern border is and how much it was reshaped and cut down and, and all as part of the, the garbage company work, you know, you might say. So um that's a good one i think and i do think it's almost like if we talk about people don't think about garbage but it's like it's it's a, it's a significant factor um in the neighborhood and has a long history in the way the the whole city you know deals with garbage and recycling and all that so yeah. and, and you know just having it in our backyard a lot of people may think of it as a negative but you know they've been great neighbors they've been good neighbors um they are responsive because of the years of people saying hey you can't keep dumping in our backyard so, yeah, it's not a, it's not something that anybody would want in, in their backyard, but it's here, and they can work with the neighborhood to help all of us, not just San Francisco, but also the neighborhood. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and people, like, oh, go ahead, Cynthia. No, I'd, I'd just like to put a plug in for the the Recology, the Artist in Residence program, which is a wonderful art program that that people. Some people know about, but a lot of people don't. And uh, that would be something that we could also highlight another time. I do think, like, I think I was thinking about that, too. It's almost like you have one of the best sort of arts programs, gallery, mu almost museum at times, you know, right there that people don't even know about in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, very creative and interesting things that artists do on site there. Um, all right, Carrie, what, okay, so we got some good ideas. We've got some projects for sure that we've been talking about. Um, what's the next step, Carrie Young of San Francisco Heritage? <laughs> what do we do next? Well, the next step is, well, we really want, you know, this Heritage in the Neighborhoods program, we want this to be community led and we wanna, you know, use heritage resources uh, to, 
help tackle a preservation project in the neighborhoods that we you know, bring this program to, and in this case, Visitation Valley. And so usually following our spotlight month, we have a town hall. And because our, you know, when we launched this program during the pandemic in 2020, uh, these town halls have had to be virtual, but we are hoping that we can do something in person, uh, possibly in December, and uh, we'll do this together with the history project folks. And it's really a, a fun community gathering where we can come together, talk about the month, talk about fun Visitation Valley history, and just hear from folks about, you know, what we should tackle. And we can pick one preservation project. And um, as we've learned from going into other neighborhoods in the city, such as the Excelsior and the Parkside, it's like every neighborhood is going to, you know, want something different, you know, there's going to, every neighborhood's going to have different needs for what they want to tackle, you know, whether that's making, you know, a legacy business, a, you know, businesses into legacy businesses or landmarking a building or what have you. So uh, this is our chance to hear from, hear from you uh, about the kinds of things that we, we can take on. We were kind of thinking, I don't know if uh, we've talked to you guys about it, but we were kind of thinking maybe we would do an online one, like in the middle of a week in the evening, just so, because some people, it's just, that's the only way they can participate. And then maybe have a follow-up on the weekend where we do a little walk or we meet in a, in a place in Visitation Valley so that people who are more face-to-face -face and want to get out and see some of the neighborhood um, can attend that. So kind of maybe a double, a twofer town hall is what we were thinking of, so. I want to say, you know, I do thank you guys because uh, you did mention how the landmarks are sort of clustered in one part of the city and there are no like landmarks on this side of the city and there are none in Visitation Valley. And I don't know what's the closest one, maybe the Bayview, uh, but uh, you know, Excelsior, maybe do they have one in Portola? But yeah, just the fact that there's a big hole in our um, uh, historic, legacy status in that sense that we don't have those landmarks, but there are buildings that will be eligible, but nobody's looking out here. For sure, for sure. Well, I don't think we could have done it without you guys, for sure. So I guess Carrie and I just want to thank you. We, we had it kind of easy in a sense that Visitation Valley A was such a great neighborhood, so interesting, so many interesting stories, and that most people didn't know about it. And B, we had you. We had you to help us just kind of write some of the posts, do the interviews, give us guidance, and really uh, support us on the whole way. So thanks so much to the Visitation Valley History Project. And um, I guess we'll stay tuned, but I think we're thinking maybe like early December, we'll have our, our next get together if that's okay. Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, I think we have one question. Sure. Um, on from Facebook. Gia. I'm sorry, if, uh, apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. <laughs> Uh, are there any plans to connect the Greenway across streets, for instance, with raised crosswalks? Oh, this is from when we were talking about the Greenway uh, oh, a yeah, little while back. Or something? Well, I think um, like uh, colored sidewalks uh, markings like they have, I think, in the Castro, like with the um, rainbow crossings. I think there actually is uh, discussions on some of that because a lot of the Greenways cross mid-block, or some of them at least. Um, there is a pot of money, a pool of money that's sort of uh, impact fees from developments. If we ever get some of the developments uh, off the ground, which we didn't talk about that a little bit on stage lock and that whole development. But once those developments happen, there will be a pot of money that can do small projects like that within the neighborhood. Hmm. Great. Great. Anybody on Facebook ask any questions, Carrie, that we should know about? I don't think so. I think right. for well, now, gonna, but... We recorded this, so we're gonna put it up later. If you want somebody else to watch this or you wanna ask a question later on Facebook or anything, uh, we'll, we'll look at that and the video will be up and we'll be able to like right. chime in and get back to you and tell you more about our get together that we'll have in December. Yeah, and of course, exactly. We'll have our two town hall opportunities for you to come out and talk more with us and ask your questions. So um, just stay tuned for, for news about that. Actually, David just asked just asked a question. He wants to know Does, if you guys have information on Candlestick Cove, which yes. we didn't really get into First. Candlestick Cove and the development there. So, of course, because Candlestick Cove was actually connected, was part of Little Hollywood. So we had the projects right within Little Hollywood, 
and until they built the freeway in 1960 and that kind of divided. But uh, no, we, and we still consider the housing over there uh, at Candlestick Cove and um, uh, as part of Visitation Valley, as part of the Little Hollywood. So yeah. yes, we do have information on it. Yeah, and <laughs> well, Executive Park, yeah. Yeah. How to get in touch with each other since he helped with the history mystery. So, yes. oh, I know. <laughs> so we can help fill you in. And, but I, I think, you know, if you go out there nowadays with Executive Park and Candace to Cope, the new housing out there in time, because Executive Park is slated to be demolished and be uh, replaced with residential, in time, it's going to be its own neighborhood just because we do have yeah. that hard barrier with the 101. Um, but it's not there yet, but it's going to be. You know, I can see in 20 years, if they do start building an Executive Park, they're going to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves and say they're their their own independent <laughs> isolated neighborhood maybe Viz valley maybe bayview or just kind of stick cold yeah all right well thank you all so much um for joining us in the middle of the day i hope you get some lunch now or get out in, in the sunshine <laughs> and we'll all talk soon thanks again from everybody all right yeah, thank, thank you guys you, thank you for helping thank you, working on this sure. yeah thank, thank you. you all bye